In January 1066, Edward the Confessor died without leaving any heirs and a struggle for succession to the English throne began. William of Normandy claimed that the late king had promised him the crown. Harold III Hardrada, king of Norway and Denmark, also claimed a right to the throne by inheritance from the Danish kings before Edward. However, the Anglo-Saxon nobility of England elected Harold Godwin's son, brother-in-law of the late Edward, as their new king. This caused the other aspirants to make preparations to invade the lands to which they believed they had a right. Hardrada was the first to attack, commanding a fleet of 300 ships and 5,000 men who landed in the north, near York. Tostig Godwin's son, brother of the new king, supported the Norse invaders as he also aspired to the throne, making the invading force number about 10,000 men. They initially achieved a victory at Fulford against the Anglo-Saxon earls who opposed them, forcing King Harold Godwin's son to march north to confront the invaders. The Vikings had camped east of the River Derwent, at Stamford Bridge. On September 25, the Anglo-Saxon army of 13,000 men approached by surprise from the west. Hardrada sent a contingent of his men to fight the Anglo-Saxons and by time while the rest of his army formed up for battle. After a brief fight, the Viking advance party had to retreat, defeated by Godwinson's forces. However, the Anglo-Saxons were unable to cross to the other side of the river because a huge Viking berserker stood on the bridge, killing everyone who tried to cross. For an hour the Viking managed to defend the bridge, until he was finally defeated. By the time the Anglo-Saxon army crossed the river, Hardrada's forces were already prepared and had positioned themselves in close formation protected by their shields. Harold Godwinson's army, forming up in front of the Norsemen, charged against them, starting a fierce battle. The Anglo-Saxons were unable to break the Viking shield wall and the armies separated with a short truce. Godwin's son then sent the militias to attack, leaving behind the Huskerls, his best warriors. Soon the militias had to retreat. This caused the Vikings to break ranks and launch themselves in pursuit. Then the Anglo-Saxons turned and counterattacked while the Huskerls who were keeping up the rear surrounded the Vikings. After hard fighting, Harold Hardrada was killed by an arrow and the Vikings began to retreat. At this point in the battle reinforcements arrived for the Norse. They were about 3,000 men led by Eistian or who had been left protecting the ships in Rickald, about 25 kilometers away and who arrived exhausted from the march.
They managed to hold off the English advance for a time, but eventually their leader was killed and their defeated troops turned and fled. Tostig Godwin's son, an ally of the Vikings, also lost his life in the battle and his troops dispersed. Most of the fleeing Viking army died at the hands of the pursuing Anglo-Saxons. About 500 Viking survivors surrendered and under the command of Olaf, son of Harald Hardrada, returned to Norway. Three days later, while Harald Godwin's son was still celebrating the victory, news reached him of William of Normandy's landing. By forced marches, after leaving a large number of troops and with the rest recovering from the previous battle, he headed south, recruiting men along the way. The Norman landing took place at Pevensey, Sussex, on September 28. There, they built a small castle surrounded by a palisade as a base of operations. William commanded a force of around 9,000 men, including about 2,000 horsemen and 1,600 archers and crossbowmen. A large part of the army was made up of their Breton, French and Flemish allies. Unlike the Saxon army, the Norman army had a modern army structure, with distinct bodies of archers, men-at-arms and cavalry. The Normans spent the next few days plundering the area to stock up on supplies and wait for news from their rival. Meanwhile, Harold Godwin's son and his army of 8,000 men reached London and continued south to confront the Normans before they reached the capital. The Saxons arrived within a short distance of the village of Hastings and decided to wait. Harold's army was made up almost exclusively of infantry and barely had archers. Half of the troops were made up of huskerels, elite infantry, and the other half were militias recruited for battle among peasants and artisans, less well-armed and protected than the rest. On October 14, Duke William was informed that the Anglo-Saxons had taken up a defensive position near Hastings and decided to leave the castle and attack. They needed a quick victory to avoid being isolated and the Anglo-Saxons receiving reinforcements. The place chosen by the Anglo-Saxons was Senlac Hill, which had a gentle slope and was protected by forests and ravines. In the southern part the land was swampy and crossed by a stream. The Anglo-Saxons deployed at the top of the hill in a closely grouped formation, with the Huskerls in front and the local militias behind. The first ranks of the Huskerls formed a shield wall to better repel the Norman attacks. Behind, stood King Harold with a personal guard of 500 men. For his part, William arranged the Normans in the center. The archers and crossbowmen in the front row with the infantry behind. In the rear he placed the cavalry commanded by himself. On the left flank he placed the Breton infantry and cavalry and on the right flank he deployed the French and Flemings. Despite being forced to attack head-on and uphill through muddy terrain, William's infantry charged while the archers also fired at the Anglo-Saxons. The Bretons on the left wing, who had advanced faster and had entered into combat earlier with the shield wall, began to suffer heavy casualties. They soon had to flee, leaving the flank of the Norman attack unprotected. Seeing this retreat, a group of Huskerls and Anglo-Saxon militiamen began to chase them down the hill. The Bretons, reorganized by William, stopped fleeing and turning around faced their pursuers by surrounding them. Most of the Anglo-Saxons were killed and a few managed to return to the rest of the army. Seeing this success and that they could not defeat the enemies positioned in such a compact formation, William ordered a series of false retreats to attract more Anglo-Saxons and thus weaken the shield wall. The Normans, pretending to flee, caused a large number of Harold's men to run after them. Soon after, they turned around and attacking them from all sides killed most of them. At dusk and after hours of fighting, Harold still dominated the hill and both armies were exhausted. A contingent of cavalry advanced and in the confusion of the combat managed to position itself behind a group of militiamen whom he annihilated.
Afterwards, the cavalrymen returned to their initial position behind the infantry. After a new charge by the Norman infantry Harold Godwinson fell dead. Panic then gripped the Anglo-Saxons who were left leaderless as Harold's brothers had also died. Many militiamen fled, but the Huskerls continued to fight desperately. The Norman cavalry advanced surrounding the Saxons on all sides. As night approached, the Anglo-Saxons, totally demoralized and without hope of receiving help, fled in all directions, each wherever they could. The Normans pursued them, killing many. The Battle of Hastings had ended after a full day of fighting. Around 4,000 Anglo-Saxons and 2,000 Normans and their allies perished. Although William expected the immediate submission of the English leaders, they proclaimed the only remaining prince, Edgar Athelney, king. The Normans then advanced towards London in a march slowed by fighting with local forces. Finally, two months after the battle, William triumphantly entered London after receiving the submission of the last English nobles. William's victory marked the origin of the future Hundred Years' War, since the territory of Normandy was linked to England. On December 25, William was proclaimed king at Westminster Abbey and became known as William the Conqueror.